All right, folks, uh, another treat here on Do You Know Jack Radio Show with Jack Antonio because I have extreme frontman Gary Sharon on the line. How you doing, Gary? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me, bro. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, now the big news is that uh, uh, it's been, uh, you know, the 25th uh, anniversary of uh, porno graffiti come and gone. Uh, I mean, that's, that's quite the milestone by any stretch. Congratulations, man. Yeah, I guess so. Kind of our silver anniversary of porno uh, kind of puts things into perspective. Getting old. Well, now you know. I I know like a lot's been talked about in terms of you know fellow Boston uh, classic rockers. I guess <laughs> it's it's probably weird for you to hear the term classic rock in terms of uh, extreme now. But uh, I mean, you know, Aerosmith is is you know ro- rolling in on their 40th as well and i know you guys have listed them as uh, a primary influence now is that just geographical or is there actually a musical in- influence there as well oh yeah um well both obviously i mean you know we're uh it, it, that was one of extremes uh we were proud to come from boston because it was the home of aerosmith but you know aerosmith i think uh you know in the early days it was aerosmith queen and and Van Halen, we were kind of the bastard child of those bands. But, yeah. uh, you know, over the years, we got to tour with Aerosmith and and we become friends with some of the guys. And uh-huh. and uh, so uh, we do hold that with a badge of honor, but yeah. uh, following in their footsteps, hopefully. With, with Queen, is that like, you know, like Extreme is really well known for the vocal arrangements. So, I mean, is that where the Queen influence comes in? Yeah, I think, and obviously, it, and it all goes back for a lot of bands, you know, even with Queen, probably the Beatles, but uh, the Queen harmonies, how they emphasize, uh, you know, those harmonies, those big harmonies. I think mm-hmm. uh, I think Van Halen plays a role, too. Um, you know, we're a three-piece rock band. Uh, we got a bass player with a high, high voice. And we call we always call Pat the Four Man Michael Anthony. <laughs> Those uh, bands were um, kind of the template back in the day before we found our identity. And I think I think it was Pornography that uh, that record is where we found our identity. You know, during the clubs we were you know writing songs that those years in the mid eighties. That's but right. By yeah. the time porno came out, we kind of discovered ourselves. You guys were actually uh, ro- road testing um, the porno graffiti songs, right? I mean, because you know the first the first extreme record kind of got got stalled by the label. So you guys were were playing songs off the first record, but then you were also looking forward to the second record, which you know I, I would imagine now like it would be a huge advantage then that you were working the porno graffiti songs and kind of working the kinks out right yeah that's exactly you're correct that's what happened uh the first record got delayed you know usual first band delays record companies remixes and all that stuff Mm -hmm. uh and there was a frustration there but we were we were touring that first record and uh we were by the time that record came out we were past that record. We were we were writing. Uh, you know, I remember on that first tour we were doing "Get the Funk Out." We were doing uh, "Decadent Stance," and uh, when we went in to record "Pornography," you know, we had the arrangements in our back pocket, and uh, you know, we were we were seasoned going into uh, the studio. I think that was uh, one of the reasons for its, for its success as well. Yeah, well, and I mean, it's interesting that you had, you know, that you had mentioned how the the arrangements were already worked out because I mean, I know like you had Michael Wagner as a, you know, a, a producer, quote unquote. But you you also, I think it the, there's a comment mentioned in passing that, uh, you know, he, he in, in some respects he was kind of a figurehead, and and maybe that's because some of the songs were maybe already worked out. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, sure. But to his credit. You know, he was, to his credit, he, he was the one who said when he heard the demos, he goes, this is 90% done. Yeah. So uh, I, I give I give him a lot of credit where he, you know, he didn't need to uh, change it for the sake of changing it. But, you know, he guided us where we needed it. And, yeah. um, you know, he he, uh, he was a big part in that way. I don't, I don't diminish his role. You know, obviously, uh, Nuno, uh, Nuno and Bob St. John, who who engineered most of our stuff, all our demos in the first record, you know, played a big role as well. But uh, Michael was great. He has a, 
he has a laundry list of, of successful bands oh, that he yeah. worked with before us and after us. So we were thrilled to have him. Well, now there is a Michael Wagner sound, though, and I think you know from from what I was picking up just from watching the the documentary uh, that you guys put out that 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 stamp is is on the record to a certain degree. Yeah, I would agree. And at, you know, at that time, it's funny in retrospect. You look back, and uh, you you know, you if you're around long enough, you see we we were we were part of that scene. Some of the some of the production tricks, some of the big drum sounds. Of course, looking back, I, I kind of like the later records. They're a little cleaner, uh, a little more pristine as far as uh, sound wise. Mm-hmm. But uh, pornography, I thought fit well within that genre at the time. I thought the I thought our music I thought our music and some of the eclecticism on that record separated us from some of those bands. You know, some of the songs that I think of, uh, you know, when I first first kissed you, or even even more than words. Yeah. In the era in the era of power ballads, more than words really was not a power ballad. It was very stripped down, simple little guitar and two vocals. When I think of power ballads, I think of I think of production. I think of big drums and big harmonies. Yeah. So I right. thought more than words was an anomaly as well. Well, I, I think pornography in a way i mean you mentioned how all your influences were coming together but i think again like you know the early 90s was a very transitional period where you know bands uh and and you know personal tastes in in terms of listening was moving sort of away from the you know quote unquote hair metal genre and maybe a little closer to uh what guns and roses was doing with uh with the sleaze rock type uh you know thing and I think maybe extreme might sort of fit somewhere in between those those two, but but then again, you were kind of forging your own path at the same time. Yeah, it's funny you said that because I think we really never fit. We didn't fit in the we didn't fit in the hair metal, and we and we didn't quite fit in uh, you know the sleaze kind of uh, down and dirty, uh, whether it was lyrically or anything. Even though you know we touched on that, yeah. I think extreme was an an odd band in that era and it worked it worked to our advantage in some areas and it didn't in others you know i I don't think we were a real good fit with some of the tours i mean we played with everyone from bon jovi to zz top to brian adam yeah and we were never quite we were never quite a fit in any of those categories yeah yeah, I I was thinking now too, just watching like uh, you know your your original drummer Paul Geary. I mean, for for the most part, had uh, you know short hair. I mean, not that I not that I want to be like that, yeah, you know, shallow or whatever you want to call it. But I mean, that that in itself might have uh, been a bit of an oddity in terms of the overall look of sleaze rock or uh, or hair metal. Yeah, no, I agree. No, I don't think that's shallow at all. Um, uh, again, that was one of uh, the things that it wasn't, um, you know, we, we didn't uh, overtly do that. It was just part of the character of the band. But it, it was another thing that separated the band because we weren't all mop top uh, hair metal guys. I mean, we, we all had our hair. But, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that our drummer was kind of, uh, no, he, he, and he was the worst of them. He wasn't the clean cut guy. I could go on with stories about that, but <laughs> that was another thing I think uh, subtle, but a subtle uh, difference. You mentioned, uh, you know, the the Queen influence, and Brian May has some very flattering words for for Nuno uh, and and the get the funk out guitar solo that that happens, of course, on pornography. I mean. Now I've I've talked to other frontmen of different bands, you know, like D- Dimebag Daryl, for instance, and his Floods um guitar solo and and i know philip has stated that dime was kind of working periodically over the years working that solo up i mean uh you know what was is is nuno kind of a guitar player that follows a similar mo where there's bits and pieces of solos that you know come together in different songs or is he working everything out start to finish usually yeah back in the early days he would structure solos um a little more but not over the years I mean, Nuno was pretty prolific um, yeah. early on. And whether you go to the first record with Play With Me or Get the Funk Out, even Decadent Stance, he sometimes would emphasize melody, obviously with a little bit of, obviously with a little bit of shredding. But I think what Brian pointed out, and almost brought Nuno to tears when Nuno first heard Brian say that, because, you know, you have the master 
uh, going over Nuno solo. We were all stunned. Yeah. Uh, when when we're listening to Brian, because we're you know we're still in a, a crouched position, uh, worshiping Queen. <laughs> so to hear that, stuff, yeah, uh, was amazing. And what Brian said, but I, I think Nuno now more Nuno's more of a he doesn't plan them out as much. Uh, but back in the day, they were a little bit more structured. Now, more than words, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. A bit, bit of a bit of a double-edged sword kind of a thing, because on the one hand, it put you guys massively on the map, but then on the other hand, maybe it might have pigeonholed you guys as kind of the uh, acoustic, uh, you know, ballad rock kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, that MTV unplugged kind of a band. Yeah, um, you know, people forget that. It's funny. There was a eight month period where, you know, more than words when it when it blew up in '91. It was followed by Wholehearted, another acoustic That's song. That's right. So, yeah. you know that that pigeonholed this band, and and um, even though we got tours because of the success of of those songs, there was a confusion there. A lot of people would go into record stores looking for the you know two acoustic guys, and the you know the uh, the clerk would send him to the heavy metal hard rock section and say it's on the porn of graffiti record. And uh, I can imagine the, <laughs> the confusion. But again, if you look back, you look back, I mean, I don't think, I've said it before, I don't think we'd be having this conversation about porn of graffiti, the record, if it wasn't for the success of that song, especially. Not to say that the record wasn't good, yeah. but, you know, would we be celebrating 25 years if more than words... <laughs> The success of More Than Words, you know, introduced yeah. the mainstream to the band the, and the rest of the nine-tenths of what we do, whether it's, For sure. you know, second, second stance or whatever. Well, well, the release is called Extreme Pornography Live 25, uh, mixed in uh, 5.1 surround sound and there's an accompanying bonus documentary uh, dropped October 14th. I think I said that. And uh, we, we've got we've got Gary Sharon on the line. Uh, it was uh, it was great having you, man. That's fantastic, man. Thank you again.